Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to welcome Edmund. I see you do back to Access Chat. This is your second appearance here. We had you on a couple of years ago, um, but this time you're all, all on your own. Um, it's great to see you back. Um, we're constantly engaging with you on Twitter, but uh, it would be good if you could uh, give us a reminder of, of what you're working on and everything before we engage in the conversation. I know we're going to cover a number of topics today, including sort of inclusive workplaces, but also um, some of the issues and, and challenges that that people in developing nations face when uh, when living with disabilities and, and trying to get education and work. Yeah. So over to you, Edmund. Yes, thank you. Um, and thanks for having me. Um, it's, it's always a pleasure to join uh, three of you um, in this amazing, amazing work that you've been doing. Uh, so my name is Edmund Asiedu, and I'm originally from Ghana, uh, particularly in the western part of Africa. Um, right now, I've been in the United States for about 10 years, and I currently work as an assistant director of career services at Columbia University. Uh, Mailman School of Public Health and basically providing career guidance to uh, students and alumni. Um, but aside this, I, my interest when it comes to persons with disabilities is the intersection of education and employment, right? How education influences employment of uh, persons with disabilities. And as we, we all know, if we really want persons with disability to be able to live independently, then we have to make sure that they have education that will serve as their passport to get an employment. Um, and so, so that is something that I've been really passionate about um, for a long time. And so even though the, the work that I'm doing right now is sort of like career development, so I've always been thinking about how best I can use my position to support uh, persons with disabilities. So over here, I'm in charge of um, two programs that definitely advance the cause of you know, for persons with disabilities. Uh, that is a specific coaching program that has been designed for students with disabilities. And also I am the campus coordinator for the federal um, you know, employment program that is called Workforce Improvement uh, Program. Uh, that is run by the US uh, Department of Labor um, in collaboration with other, um, you know, federal departments. And so basically that is me and I am a passionate disability inclusion advocate. Oh, we know that for sure. We we see you out there on on the social media channels, always uh, doing that advocacy work and, and, and we applaud you f for Thank that. You. Um, and, and you're right, you know, education is, is tremendously important because it's going to affect everybody's career prospects. Um, but there are significant challenges for people with disabilities getting that education in, in the first place. Now, ev even in, you know, developed nations uh, where, where we have money and uh, directing resources in, into this kind of stuff, there are still challenges. But Growing up in Ghana with a disability, you must have, uh, you know, found it quite challenging. You've, you've, you've succeeded, um, but you know, describe for us a little bit about some of the the challenges that that you faced. Okay, great. So the the, the first challenge, and almost every individual who lives with you know, with disability in Africa can attest to, is infrastructural challenges, right? the barriers that we encounter infrastructurally. Um, you know, I would say that in Ghana, I can confidently say that almost all the elementary schools are not accessible to you know, children with disabilities, right? So originally I was, you know, the, the doctor or the orthopedist that, you know, that was taking care of me had recommended that I use wheelchair permanently. That was the recommendation. But this is what was happening. Like Antonio, you know, mentioned, any time my parents had to send me to school, they had to go together because they had that problem of carrying me to get to one floor and then also carrying me from there to get to the classroom. 
And so always they had to go together. If, if not, and my parents were basically peasant farmers. And so early in the morning, one has to go to the farm to make sure that you will have food on the table. But because of me, they had to do that every morning. So infrastructurally, the barriers are there, right? It's, it's, it's really clear. And it not only, not only the, um, the elementary school, the senior high school or the high schools that we have, they also have these barriers existing. The universities, they all have these barriers existing. I remember when I was getting into, when I was getting into college back home uh, in Ghana, Ghana Institute of Journalism, um, where I studied journalism I and mean, communication study. And I remember in my admission, you know, so first they had they they will shortlist everybody those who are qualified for an interview. And so I was shortlisted and I went to meet this panel of you know interviewers. And guess what happened? One person actually just ruled me out right in my face that Edmund, I don't think you can be in this school because all our classrooms are on the first floor, like the next floor, that you would need an elevator to get there. And I challenged him. I said, I can do it. And then he asked me a follow-up question. What, how, how, how would you do that? And I, and I laid down my plan. I said, one, I'm gonna ask you to, to bring every class that I will take to the, 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 the floor that I can easily get into. Even if I have to struggle to get there, that will be really minimal. And two, if I'm not able to get there, then I'll be asking the school to provide a means for me to get to the school, the classroom. And then all of them started laughing. But there is always one person somewhere who will say that, okay, hey, you know what? Let me become the champion of this person, or let me talk on behalf of this person. So one person on the panel actually started speaking on, on my behalf. Said that, hey, let's give this gentleman a chance because he has something to prove to all of us. That was it. And I was admitted into the school. But during that time, I had to sort of like reinvent myself. I started using uh, crutches more so that I could climb some of the, you know, some of the stairs myself and all that, because that is a reality. Even in, in, in New York City here, we have so many barriers, you know, when it comes to the transportation system and all that. So that is, infrastructure challenges is really huge. A lot of parents, they don't take, their, they don't send their kids to school because of that. You know, and also like societal problems, right? For example, a lot of parents, once you have a person with disabilities, a lot of people will make effort to sort of like shame you, right? And so what happens is that a lot of parents really hide their children. They don't, they don't send them out, they don't take them out. Some of them even stay at home, not even just at home, in a room, and some even die you know, as a result of loneliness and, and all that. But I was really lucky. My mom, my parents were really proud of me. They were even sometimes like exchanging words with people just for me. You know, they, they didn't care about whatever somebody would say. And then the last thing that probably is for the sake of time, you know, I'll mention is financial, right? A lot of, a lot of, most of uh, the persons with disabilities or children with disabilities in Ghana, like myself, growing up, come from, you know, poverty, you know, poverty stricken homes, like there is no money to send you to school because Ghana education is cash and carry, right? Even right now, they will say that, oh, there is still free education in Ghana. There is nothing like free because at the end of the day, they'll be asking parents to pay for uh, cultural fees, sports fees, and all of them. Even you have to buy your own books. So there is nothing like free education in Ghana right now. So financially, it is a problem. You know, going to college, I had to physically approach parliamentarians in Ghana from my, from my community, you know, to ask them that I needed money to pay for my college. And lo and behold, two of them actually signed, signed on to that. And so, you know, every, every three months, I will go to them, you know, for checks to pay for my, to pay, to pay for my tuition. But at the end of the day, how many, you know, 
young people with disabilities will be able to take this kind of challenge upon themselves. You know, even if they want to do that, if they are sitting in wheelchairs, how would they even navigate, you know, the cities that, that we have around there? So for the sake of time, those are the, the, the only, um, you know, challenges that I can highlight because they are really prime. They are really, really, I, I, I don't even want to get into the digital part of it because like technology-wise, it's really, really challenging. If you have visual impairment, you know, yes, it's, it's really, really tough. For you to for you to get education, even though we have some segregated, you know, like schools, like you know, school for the blind and all that, still that the, the digital divide is still is still in existence. Oh, yeah, no, that's a, it's a, a amazing story of, of your own personal resilience, and and uh, I'm amazed at, uh, at how unsustainable the model is that everyone has to go directly to the politicians. Antonio, I know you had a question. I, I do. So, uh, Ghana signed the the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities in 2012. Okay, so let's let's just go there. Okay. Yeah. So so there have been several reports, several recommendations from the UN. So yeah. where were you in 2012, and where are you now? What really changed? So. When 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 it comes to when it comes to CRPD implementation, right? Let's let's look at it from. I always want to talk about why politicians in developed countries or in developing countries, sorry, always rush to sign on to these kind of conventions, right? One, they want to look good. They want to appear good. They wanna. They want you know. They want the whole wide world because we've seen these even leaders from these countries, especially my own country, you know, Dana Kufuado, who is the current president, we've seen him being praised, you know, at the international level, at the UN and all that. But trust me, in reality, there is nothing, nothing is happening in our country, specifically for persons with disabilities. Nothing is happening. Now, two, one of the reasons, the other reason why a lot of politicians rush in ratifying the convention is that they want to use that as a bait to get more money, right? It's a bait to get more money because at the end of the day, when they are going in for loans and all that, yes, they will definitely be saying that, oh, we sign on to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. We have a disability law and all that advancing the cause for you know, Ghanaians with disabilities and all that. Now, again, in reality, both these two national documents practically are not existing, right? Because accommodations, we cannot definitely like talk about it, right? Financially, financially, even 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 scholarships and grants and all that that were supposed to like be instituted in order to support the education of children with disabilities, you know, persons with disabilities, doesn't even exist. And so that is why I don't know whether you have heard about it, but a lot of persons with disabilities living in developing countries, and Ghana is one of them, you know, just get on the street, you know, to beg for arms. It's like to beg for arms because at the end of the day, they 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 they, they hope that somebody will sort of like what pity them because usually a lot of people they give this kind of money not because they are empathetic or something like that. It's because they see you as somebody who is helpless, right? And so they they will go and stand there and they will get something um, out of it. So it's 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 really it's really delicate. It's 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 complex. It's really complicated. It's like you cannot really like know why they sign on to these without having plans. For example, the, the, the CRPD, you know, the Convention on the Right of Persons with Disabilities, we all know that once you ratify it, you are given a certain period of time, right? I don't know, maybe it's about it's about five to ten years or something like that for you to prepare for its implementation, right? And Ghana ratified this, let's say right now it should be about let's say twelve to thirteen years now, and it's still not being implemented. How the United Nations really want it. And that is why 
I've, I've always been saying that the United Nations, the other organizations like the World Bank and all that, they really have to send independent auditors to go to these countries. Make sure, like three of you, three of you could go to a country and really come up, come up with an unbiased, unbiased report that can go a long way to help people with disabilities. And so, um, that is but but I, I would like to follow on that. So sometimes yeah. we, we, that is something that I see happening in other countries. You know, uh, in Portugal we have, you know, regulation. We sign it. The treaties, we, we ratify them, but some things are not that different from Ghana, okay? Uh, yeah. So let me just stop there. Uh, so, but what is civil society doing? You know, because sometimes, sometimes you see that that's the case. You no, know, yeah. governments are, are not doing what they could do, but yeah. uh, civil society uh, are able to mobilize and make change and use the resources of the United yeah. Nations to change. Uh, things uh, in a positive matter. So, what is civil society doing uh, in the in that aspect? So, civil society. I would say, trust me, I am really proud of the civil society, um, you know, industry or the, um, the 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 like the nonprofit, you know, organizations. What they are doing in these countries, right? For example, in Ghana, there has always been a collaboration between. Um, for example, Ghana Federation of the Disabled, Ghana Society of the Physically Disabled, um, Ghana um, Association for the Blind, and all of them, the deaf, the albinos, and all that, they've been coming together to work with other organizations and even religious bodies, right, in order to make sure that, you know, the country moves forward in its implementation of some of these um, international laws and even internally the disability acts that we have. But this is what this is what we've been seeing, right? The effort that I made, for example, I was part of the Ghana Society of the Physically Disabled. I played leadership roles, you know, between 2005 and 2000 and 2009. And the disability law was passed in 2006. You know, that was one of the strategies that we used that was really, really effective was sort of like heckling the politicians. And the reason why we started heckling them was that they didn't want to they didn't want to engage us in real conversation, right? They want they wanted a situation where like they would just put something in your face and then you take it and then you go away, right? But when, whenever you start saying something that is a little different from their view, then they, they begin to create that that opposition or even prevent you at all from coming into contact with them. So the civil society organizations and all that. They are doing a lot of work, believe me. And, and usually this is something that a lot of international you know, donors can attest to, um, like DANIDA, you know, Danish International Development um, Agency. We work with them. They train us. I was trained in Denmark uh, some years ago to go back to work, and I did that. I, I did that, and, you know, it, they can, the, the um, you know the U.S. the U.S. International Development um, Agency could also could also attest to that fact. The civil society they are making the effort. It's just that they don't usually see any form of commitment from the governments that we have, the leadership. I mean, the political leadership that we have in these countries. So they are doing their part, but we want to see more from the leaders that we have. I believe I, I responded to your question. Yes, and you know, you I did, saw that did. when I, yeah, well, I've been over, uh, I've visited Africa a couple of times, Africa a couple of times, and when I was in Kenya, I was really, I was shocked at the conditions yeah. because I've traveled all over the world and, and I, I live like you now in the United States and we understand corruption in the U.S. so much better now than we did even a few years ago, how corrupt 
many people are. But I remember when I went to Kenya, I was shocked. I was really, really shocked by the corruption. I was shocked by the political leaders that were making all these promises and then what was actually happening to the people. I, I, was, I was shocked to see uh, villagers from traveling days to get to a disability person organization meeting because they had nothing. They, it, it was just it seemed overwhelming the problems were so big and I remember bringing um, a suggesting a US aid grant to some of the disability person organizations and the the infighting that started happening and it, it, it was and uh, it was really almost overwhelming for me because I'm thinking okay well have you you do a b c d and it's like yeah a little bit more to this and, and also what I found was there was the, and you mentioned this early on but this is a huge problem not just in Ghana this is in a lot of countries including developed countries like US and the UK but there were certain members of society it seems to be more so in um, countries like Ghana and Kenya and others that they looked down on the families I mean the families were you know they were um, they had done something wrong in another life God was mad at them the, the ridiculousness of the issues that people had to deal with like somebody born with being an albino I you know I know that there used to be a law supposedly it's gone now in Kenya that if a woman gave birth to a child that was an albino uh, her husband had to legally divorce her because she cheated on him even though of course that is a genetic thing has nothing to do with a woman cheating on her husband and also she had to put the baby in the forest which means she had to abandon the baby to die and the animal uh, it was it was horrible and then keeping albino babies alive because their blood is so powerful and black voodoo magic and yeah. some of the issues like that it, it was it was startling to me as a maybe naive American because I knew there was a lot of issues there's a lot of issues all over the world for people with disabilities which is why we do access chat which is why you do the work you do but I think it's very difficult for us to really truly understand what these individuals with disabilities and these parents are walking it's really bad I, it's really, really, really bad to the point where it, it's it's hard to wrap your mind around it. And so, and like you said, there's a lot of aid groups trying to help. And um, thank goodness for somebody like you that is just a superhero. And God bless your parents and your mother who gave you that wonderful Ghana shirt, which I love. That is a beautiful shirt. So. But it's 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 got to be overwhelming, which is why I know you're heavily involved in the UN and why we want to help you too. Thank you. And you know, it's interesting. One point I'll make. One more point, and then I'll give it over to back over to Neil. But you know, the United States. I'm always nagging and whining because the United States has signed the UNCRPD but we haven't ratified it and I feel that we should ratify it and there are other politicians I'm not a politician but there's politicians that feel we don't need it because we have the Americans with Disabilities Act but the reality is the reality is even though it is not perfect in the US by any stretch of the imagination exactly. we still have done so much more I mean, do you? I mean, you can attest to that. Living in Ghana and then living in the U.S., yes, there's still parts that are not accessible. We still have ridiculous in unemployment yeah. rates, but you start comparing it to countries like Ghana and others, yeah. and yeah. The, the gap is so wide that um, it, you know. And, 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 and you know, you are right. You are right. I mean, the thing is, U.S. ratification of um, of the. Convention on the Right of Persons with Disabilities is really, really crucial, right, to um, the success of this whole convention, right? Because a lot of a lot of the disability laws that we have around the countries, you know, around the world, sorry, modeled the disability law that we have in the U.S., right? And so, like U.S. U.S. leadership is really, really crucial. And also, secondly. I mean, United States is not an island. No, it's not. Even if it was an island, it's not. It's not a separate planet. No, you have. It's not. Aren't we number not. one? We're number it's, one. It's, Sorry. It's, <laughs> not, it's not. 
right? But at the end of the day, yeah, we're part of the day, world. Exactly, we are part of the world. At the end of the day, persons with disabilities, like there is an there is an organization here in the U.S. called Mobility International, that is doing a great job, you know, in yes. encouraging you know young people and people with disabilities in general here, Americans with disabilities, to travel abroad, you know, for exchange programs and all that. So, what kind of situations do we you know, do we expect them to encounter, for example, when they go to Ghana, when they go to Kenya, when they go to Bangladesh, when they go to all these countries around the world, India, everywhere, China, everywhere, what kind of conditions do we, you know, expect them to encounter? And so, I, I 2013, I was doing an internship in Washington, D.C. as a um, disability policy, uh, you know, intern and with the National Disability Right Network. And one of my duties was actually going to the, the hill, you know, the Capitol Hill, to advocate, you know, and sometimes even lobby a little bit, you know, to to see. And some of the politicians talking to them were really strong about that, you know, that, hey, we have this law here, we don't need that, and all that. And getting to the end of the year, in 2013, we tried to get it ratified, and it fell short of, I believe, about three votes. And so we can actually ratify that. So those are some of the things. And, and thank you for pointing that out, which, which means that the United States is no entirely different from what is happening in other countries. I agree. I agree. Neil, Neil. I think you're talking, but you're yes. muted. Yeah, that would be better if I did unmute, wouldn't it? A uh, bit of a newbie error there. Um, so it's great to have the frameworks. It's great to have examples to, to follow. Um, but at the same time, going back to your day-to-day day -day work, you know, we, we need to be making sure that people are um, able to work and have access to employment and jobs. So obviously education is the pipeline because without the qualifications, you, you can't get into the jobs. But once, you know, assuming we get to that point where where we've solved the issues in education um, and, and you have qualified people with disabilities to get the, get the jobs. What are the next steps that, that you're working on to, to help people um, get those meaningful jobs and, 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 and be able to uh, you know, have a, a, a good career? Exactly. So one of the things that one of the things that I've been part of, um, especially in New York City, and I would say like in the U.S., you know, um, is that the education of employers, right? Like educating, let's call it sensitizing, right? Sensitizing employers um, on disability inclusion, right? And if we say, if we talk about, you know, disability inclusive workplace, we are, we are talking about even the hiring process, even before you make the decision to hire someone, right? What is your perception? Right? How do you perceive a job applicant with disability? As soon as you see me coming to the interview, holding two crutches, as soon as you see me coming to the interview, sitting in a wheelchair or holding a white cane, what is what comes into your mind? It's really, really important. And so a lot of effort are being made in New York City here, the New York's Mayor's Office uh, for Persons with Disabilities has initiated this campaign. Um, that is called NYC at Work. Uh, basically, it's, it's, I believe it's probably the first private-public uh, partnership um, effort. And what they are doing is that they are educating, they are sensitizing employers, you know, from both the government, um, you know, organizations and the private sectors. They are educating them on, um, you know, the importance of focusing on the abilities and Friends of persons with disabilities in the hiring process, and so what they once they you know they are able to talk to these employers, some even sign up with them, you know, to, to participate in their job fairs, and also like they have a job board where they can post jobs and all that. Now, one one of the things that I would you know I would want to say here is that when we change, no matter what. We still have people who just think that once you are called a disabled or you know a person with a disability, 
it means there is nothing that you can do. There are some people who still believe that, even though we are in the 21st century, right? But the most important here, the, the most important thing here is that we have so many people. For example, I've, I've been I've been sort of like I've been mentoring some young people with disabilities, and one of the things that I always tell them is like, you know what? The challenges are there, and you are still you're gonna face it. You know, you're gonna grow up, you're gonna get the education. You know, thank goodness if you're able to overcome all these barriers and all that. And then once you finish, there will be probably the last or the last but one that you have to cross, which is getting somebody to hire you. So when changing how people see persons with disabilities is really, really crucial. And that is why I have been part of it. Now, even here in my office environment, what I, I have an amazing team that I work with, my boss and my colleagues and all that here, they are really sensitive to you know, disability issues. Like in my office, getting my office accessible, I didn't struggle. I just had to schedule a meeting with my boss. I spoke to them. I needed a very desk. I needed a very chair and all that because sitting down for a long time, you know, causes me to feel some pain somewhere around my waist. That I don't think no doc, there is a doctor out there who can help me deal with that. So I, I'm going to live with it. But then my workspace needs to be adjusted and I got it right away, you know. Whatever, like, whatever that is happening, I got it right away. So I've been part of these campaigns and whenever we are holding uh, a career fair, you know, you know, what, what happens is that you see employees that are coming in, you know, we, we definitely, anytime, a, a, let's say a student is going out there to an interview and all that, you know, we educate them, we, we host workshops and all that, that brings some of these programs readily available to them in order to educate them on their rights, but how they can even go about um, you know, asking for accommodation, even during the interview process, right? But at the end of the day, after the interview, will you be called back for a follow-up interview or the job offer? That is the big question that uh, we, we always have. So the sensitization is going on using my Twitter handle, joining uh, you know, organizations like Disability In, you know, that is in uh, Washington, D.C., mobilizing people uh, and organizations around uh, the country to be sensitive to um, the needs of uh, persons with disabilities, particularly job seekers with disabilities. And so um, the effort is on and the education is on and the platforms like yours, oh my, you are doing an amazing work, um, trying your best to educate um, employers around the world on um, you know, accessibility in general and some technological um, devices that could um, help in this, this area. Thank, thank you. I, and I think it, it is you know, hugely important for people to feel confident to be able to ask for the accommodations or, yeah. or the adjustments, as we call them in the UK. Um, yeah. That can be tricky, um, you know, when, when you're applying for a job when, um, and you don't know the employer, lots of people don't feel comfortable declaring before they've got the job, you know, it, different types of disability demand different strategies, I guess, because yeah. obviously if you have a, um, if you have a, a, a very obvious visible disability, then you're going to, you, you know, people are going to know, you're going to gonna ask, right? But, but lots of people with hidden disabilities, they kind of frequently keep them hidden whilst they're going through the application process and, and, and it is difficult to know when best to do that. I mean, I, I, I'm up front about my dyslexia, it's hidden, but I'll, I'll talk about it because I believe that if the organization is the kind of organization I want to work for, then they're going to be accommodating. Thank you very much for your time today. It's, it's been a real great pleasure. I know we're going to have a great chat because you're very active on Twitter. Also need to thank uh, Microlink and Barclays and MyClearText for their continued support, keeping us up and running and sustaining us. Um, thank you, Edmund. It's been a real pleasure. It's been great to have you back on. Yes, thank to, you. To, to yes. joining you on Twitter on Tuesday. Yes, I look forward to the Twitter chat. Uh, thank you so much uh, to all of you. You are doing amazing work. Well.
you know, amazing work and keep it up. Please don't stop. Keep it up. Keep it up. And, you know, try try your best to, to also like sort of like, I know you've been doing that, you know, and I really like that. Uh, the fact that you are mentoring, you know, totally new generation that will possibly take it over from you. And so keep it up, you know, keep on training us. And um, um, we believe that with people like you, this world would definitely, no matter how long it takes, this world would definitely be a better place. For we're all in it. We're all in it for the long haul. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, thank you. We appreciate you. So thank you. And thank watch you for out your work. for that. Watch out for that for that Nobel Prize nomination. I will <laughs> one day. So, Mark is I'm gonna do that. It's a secret that I reveal to you. Uh, <laughs> I have plans to do that. Love for you. you yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Take care.